All right, welcome everybody. I have no idea what was going on there. Um, my computer did, like, the funny thing is my old computer, which is always dying from these things, didn't even, uh, it wasn't having any trouble. It was just YouTube kept showing me error messages. And then it started streaming, but nothing actually happened in the real world on the stream. So we'll see if this video actually makes it through anywhere. Uh, after about five minutes of YouTube saying it was streaming, I finally see the little placeholder image here. So uh, we'll see. We'll see if it works or not. Uh, but I'll talk as if it's working. Um, I, uh, I hope you're having a good week. I, uh, as with every other live stream, it'd be great to hear in the live chat uh, where you're from. If you want to post that there, I will uh, take a glance um, uh, throughout this thing and, and see what you guys are saying. And again, if you have any questions, if you have any problems or uh, feedback on, on the examples, or if you see something like uh, on the screen, the, the one of the windows is not lined up well for you to be able to see what's going on, please let me know in the comments below here and in the live stream. Um, I'm glad it looks like people can see me. So it, it looks like things are working okay. I have it running on my iPad, but it looks like it's not showing me what's actually live. Okay, there we go. All right, so it is definitely working. Um, again, this live stream series goes through uh, this book, Ansible for DevOps. And I'm just trying to make sure that my windows are all lined up here. Um, Ansible for DevOps, and we're going to be taking a look at Chapter 4 today in just a couple minutes um, and doing our first real-world playbook example. Uh, I am going to switch to um, screen share here so that you can see the agenda for today. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank again this month Device42, uh, which is a, a, a they make a product that supplements Ansible very good, uh, very well for, for a lot of companies that have lots of IT infrastructure. And I wanted to give them a plug. I wanted to say that Ansible is a great tool for driving IT automation, but to make the automation work, you need to make sure you have an accurate real-time picture of all your IT infrastructure. And that's where Device42 helps. Uh, Device42 provides comprehensive discovery of your entire IT estate from mainframes to Kubernetes. And just like Ansible, it's agentless. You can try it for free. Download a trial at device42.com and see how it can take your Ansible automation to the next level. And thanks to them, you can get copies of Ansible for DevOps and Ansible for Kubernetes free until the end of April uh, until uh, on uh, leanpub.com. Uh, so to find those, just go to leanpub, uh, search for Ansible for DevOps. You can grab a free copy if you haven't already. Um, Unfortunately, I can't give you free copies of the paperback because there's minimum costs associated with it that uh, I wouldn't be able to do. And I recommend getting the LeanPub version anyways because I can push updates out to that uh, a lot easier. If you get the book for free, I will give you free updates forever on LeanPub. That's how I, how I do things. Uh, it's kind of like open source book development. Um, anyway. Uh, a couple things I also wanted to go over. Uh, thank you so much to uh, people who started sponsoring me on GitHub this week. So Jerome Massey, Jay Sutton, Rock Out, uh, Angela Andrews, Pavel Weber, or Weber, uh, E. Archibald, LV, and I guess Sake or Sake, S4KE. Um, you guys have, have made this series possible, have made it uh, possible for me to be able to buy things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer, which are in short, short supply these days. Although we're running low on toilet paper in, in my region of St. Louis, Missouri, in the USA, it is, uh, it's kind of a, a gamble whether or not you're going to find toilet paper any given week. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody, and for some reason GitHub's not letting me check boxes, so maybe GitHub's having issues this morning too. Um, there were a few questions from last week's episode I wanted to cover really quick. Uh, one thing was somebody commented that my, my terminal window was too low in the display, and when I would type things down here, it would be covered by YouTube's play bar. So I'm going to make sure I pull that up this week. And again, if you have any issues with this live stream, please uh, leave a comment, uh, leave notes, and uh, I'll try to get to those. Uh, somebody asked, what themes and settings am I using in YouTube? Uh, things like highlighting spaces. So when I do spaces, it shows me how many spaces there are. Uh, all of my settings are actually stored in my dot .files repository. So if you search for Gearling Guy dot .files, oops, dot .files, uh, it has all of the configuration I use. In addition to, I have a playbook that I use. Uh, it's called the Mac Dev Playbook that manages my Mac. I used to have three or four Macs, so I used to run it on all those Macs, but now I just run it on this one. Uh, and I hope that this one can survive the day. 
Uh, you might be able to hear the fan in the background if you turn up the sound a lot. Um, but uh, good news on that front, and thanks especially to uh, Device42. I think it was fortuitous that they reached out to me and helped sponsor the series because with the uh, funding that I got from that, I was able to buy a new laptop this year. Uh, I wasn't planning on it, but this laptop is struggling, and uh, last week the battery started to expand, and the bottom of the case is now bulging out. Uh, this is the second time it's happened to this laptop. So my advice is don't get a 2016 MacBook Pro, even if you get a really good price on it. Uh, apparently the batteries just have really bad issues. Um, anyway, so that's where that is. Uh, somebody also mentioned that in the, in the examples of, of inventory, uh, if you run into host key checking issues, you can add this to your multi vars. That was, I think, from episode one or two. Uh, you can add strict host key checking equals no to the Ansible SSH common args, and that helps prevent the, uh, the warnings that pop up sometimes when you run a playbook or run commands and there's host key issues. Looks like the stream is having a few little issues here and there. Hopefully, uh, it's still going well. Um, if you are seeing issues, please uh, mention it in the, in the comments. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so good, good to see everybody. Um, make sure your font is larger in the terminal in Sublime. Yeah, I'll actually increase that size a little bit more just because I know some people are watching this on maybe a smaller tablet or device. Uh, sometimes I forget to do that before the stream starts. Um, another thing was uh, somebody mentioned in, uh, in, in one of the earlier videos that uh, they're, they're basic troubleshooting for all, uh, all computing, but especially Linux or Windows servers, is they always ask, is it actually plugged in? Is it turned on? Is it DNS or is it NTP? And that reminded me of the, uh, the wonderful haiku. It's not DNS. There's no way it's DNS. It was DNS. Um, I think that that's funny. That was from a Reddit user, SS Broski, on a sysadmin post. Uh, it was a year or two ago. I don't remember when that was, but um, I was just reminded of that because uh, probably two or three times per month, I find some issue that was the DNS wasn't resolving, and so something failed. It's amazing how much we, we rely on that nowadays. Um, so thanks for posting those comments. Please feel free to comment below. Um, also, if you if you like the series, please subscribe to the channel. Subscribe link is right below me, uh, and hit like on the video if the video is helpful to you. Uh, one last thing before we dive into the example in chapter four is I uh, inspired by um, I think it's Robert. Uh, I have his link down here. Uh, Robert de Bach, uh, who is from the Netherlands, uh, which is where my family comes from. Uh, he, he created a really nice content repository for all his Ansible content. So I decided to do that for my content as well because I realized a lot of people don't even realize what kind of stuff I maintain. You can see some of it in Ansible Galaxy or you can browse on GitHub, uh, but that's not that helpful. Um, so I have a listing here of all of the different Ansible content I maintain, including operators for Kubernetes, uh, container images that are built with Ansible that are on Docker Hub, uh, and roles and collections, all that kind of stuff. And I also add a little note about whether or not it's actively being maintained. Because a lot of people sometimes ask, um, you know, the book is actively maintained and my YouTube channel is actively maintained, but sometimes a project is either older or I don't use it for anything and don't really uh, feel like I can put in the, the time and effort to make it well maintained. So I wanted to make that more clear by having this listing here. Um, and it's funny, the uh, Ubuntu 12 uh, container image is still building fine, but the Ubuntu 14 image is not building fine. So I wouldn't recommend using Ubuntu 12 or 14 since they're not supported. But if you do need to, 12.04 is still working somehow. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. And now let's get into the uh, first real world playbook. Uh, let me check. Uh, let's see. So, and someone asked also. Um, uh, Mark asked, is it okay to start with Ansible for Kubernetes if one is green and interested in uh, KS Kates only? Yes, definitely. I write Kubernetes for, or Ansible for Kubernetes actually from the perspective of somebody who may have never even used Kubernetes before. Uh, it's, it's a book that takes you from like step one all the way to eventually step 100. Right now it's like step 25 or step 30. But um, that's my intention for that book. So please, again, it's free right now. So just grab a copy, even if you're not going to read it right away, because uh, it won't be free after April. 
uh, and a couple more people from the, the Netherlands. Hello, Croatia. It's great to see everybody. Norway, Poland, LA, LA to Kansas City. That's an interesting transition. See a lot in the, the reverse there. Oh, and Robert's on. Hi, Robert. Uh, I, I basically stole your idea for that Ansible content site. I uh, hope you're not too mad about it, but I think it'd be cool for more people to do that kind of thing to, to show kind of the open source breadth of stuff that they maintain. I know a few people do, but um, it's, it's good to see. Um, anyway, for our first example, I'm going to chapter four. I, I have one note. Uh, I, I grab my post-it notes from around the house. I have a note to dig out the drain by the back patio. There's a drain that's all clogged up and I need to replace it. So I guess I'll do that someday, probably after this live stream series is over. Um, but I'm going to go to page 76 in book version 1.22, I believe this is. No, 1.20. And uh, the, the example is the Ubuntu server with solar. So uh, I'll, I'll get a little bit more into uh, how, we, how we can use it and, and real world implications for it. Uh, somebody from Nashville, Tennessee, hello. Um, and, um, but uh, one thing that I do a lot of times, so somebody might say, I need this software running for my server. It might be somebody, like maybe somebody's setting up a marketing website and their marketing website needs a certain feature. Um, for a lot of sites that I have built and maintained, I, I started out doing web development and a lot of the sites were like commerce or lots of data in the site that needed to be accessible and searchable. And a lot of people start out using database-based search with Postgres or with uh, MySQL and it can work okay, but the search is pretty limited. You don't have lexers and parsers that are very configurable. You don't have uh, search suggestions that work really well. Uh, and so you start looking at what is a way that I can have, um, have a more robust search solution, that, something like Google, but for my content only. And in the old days, Google actually made search appliances that had the Google software on it that you could put into your rack and have your search data uh, stored on it. And it would have a, a front end that looked similar to Google's front end, and it would be really good. Um, but they stopped doing that appliance some years ago, and they, they also had custom site search and things. Some of those things still work okay, but you don't have control over exactly how it integrates. You don't have control over the interface as much as you'd want. And um, sometimes it's even harder to set up and, and maintain, and you don't have control over the thing that is doing the search. Uh, so a lot of people that use uh, Drupal and WordPress and uh, Adobe Experience Manager and Magento and um, any kind of self-hosted system that manages content or commerce products and things like that. A lot of these systems integrate with search products, uh, search software like Apache Solar and Elasticsearch and some other search engines too, but Apache Solar was really the first thing that built on top of Apache Lucene uh, for search services and had a pretty good API. A lot of it is XML based, which is less in style, I guess, but uh, more modern versions have made it more accessible and, and there's libraries for solar integration with almost every programming language. So um, I, since that's something that I've had to do a lot, uh, I wanted to automate that. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the tutorials and things you find online have to do with Ubuntu servers. So we're gonna use an Ubuntu server in this case, uh, but you can install it in a very similar way on CentOS or on Fedora or Debian or whatever server operating system that you want to use. So I created uh, an Amazon EC2 instance uh, in my Amazon account called Ansible Ubuntu 16.04 test. And I added a couple security group uh, rules to it. One is to allow me to SSH into the server so I can control it with Ansible. And another one is to allow me to access the server on port 8983 because that is going to be Solar's uh, port that it can run on. I could configure a different port, but that's default and I like using the defaults unless I don't have to or unless I can't. Um, so I, I took the server's public IP address and I put it into an inventory file and uh, the, the default Ubuntu image on Amazon Web Services has a user configured called Ubuntu. So I set Ansible user equals Ubuntu and I put it into this Solar group uh, up here. And this, this again is a basic inventory file that Ansible can use to, you can tell Ansible about your servers using these inventory files. And this one is in the INI syntax, it's INI style. Uh, later on we'll get into dynamic inventory and other, other inventory uh, styles like YAML and things like that. But for now, uh, this, is, this is how we're telling Ansible about, about the server. I'm going to create a playbook 
And in this case, I'm going to create a playbook and a variables file uh, because I have a few variables that I'm going to set for this solar setup so that I can change versions and upgrade and things like that later on. So I'm going to say touch main.yaml. Um, one quick note on the playbook name, you could call it anything you want. Uh, often I call the main playbook for a particular server or project main.yaml. Some people call it site.yaml. Uh, sometimes you see playbook.yaml or solar.yaml. It doesn't really matter, but it's, it's nice to be consistent. So I always call it main.yaml. And I'm also going to create a variables file called vars.yaml. And hopefully you can see everything in my terminal in sublime text OK. Uh, if you can't, let me know. Uh, so in the playbook, I'm going to say hosts solar, because that's the group that I created in inventory. And I'm going to say uh, become true. Because when I'm going to install Solar, I'm actually going to need to be the root user for most things. And I mentioned earlier, sometimes you could put become at the play level, and everything that you do is going to use the root user. And when you're managing servers, you can do anything as the root user. So if you're going to do most things as a root user, it's OK to do this. Um, sometimes you want to do it in the inverse and not be root for everything, and only become for tasks that have to become. Uh, there's there's a whole philosophical debate. You could go either way with that in terms of security, but we'll leave that for future uh, episodes. There's an episode that we'll talk about security later. Um, and then I'm going to add this vars file uh, under the key vars files, vars.yaml. And uh, this key lets you define one or more variables files that Ansible will load in before the playbook starts running. Um, but before we start installing Solar, it's good to know how to. So I'm going to search for um, uh, Apache, let's see, Apache Solar install. And we'll see what the official documentation tells us to do. There's a lot of other articles for it, but um, we'll look at the reference guide here. I know that the current version of Apache Solar is 8.x, uh, but the 7.x uh, install instructions are pretty much the same. Um, so it looks like I need to download a release from here. So I'm going to go there in another window and get there soon. Uh, it tells me that I need to have the properly sized server. In this case, I'm on the free tier in Amazon. It's not. I don't recommend using a slow free tier server for solar. Uh, the more memory it has, the better, and the faster disk it has, the better, uh, because indexing content can be a, a heavyweight operation unless you have a really small data set. Um, so. One way that you can do this is just uh, download the, the tarball and then expand it and then run it. Uh, but for production, it's, uh, you'd, you'd want to do it a little bit differently. You'd want to make sure that it's, it's run as a service in systemd and all that. So there's a section in here, uh, prod, taking solar to production. There's a section in here that tells you how to do things in production. And uh, the download includes an installer that installs a solar service that is running with systemd on the server that would um, allow me to start and stop it and enable it at boot and have options that are passed into solar when it starts up for memory and all those kind of things. So I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And the first thing that I need to do is download solar. So in the vars, I'm going to, I'm going to set up a couple variables uh, for how to uh, set the solar version and the solar, um, the, the hash for the download so that I can compare the hash when I download the package or download the tarball and make sure that it's the one that I expect. Um, so Solar 8.5.0 is the latest version. I'm going to grab I'm going to grab a download link from here. So this link actually gets me to a mirrors page. So on the mirrors page, I'm going to grab a download link, it's saying that Berkeley has the the best mirror site for me. So I'm going to copy that link, um, and I'm going to save that for later. Uh, and I'm going to create a few variables. So I'm going to have, I want to download this to a temporary location because I want to expand it and, and install it somewhere else. Uh, so I'm going to say download dir for a lot of projects. I, I just have a, I just download things to temp. Um, but you can have, have this set up a little differently. Uh, solar dir, this is where I want solar to be installed. I want it to be in the opt directory, uh, solar. Uh, solar version, that's going to be, uh, 8.5.0. And a note on this, you can quote this. You don't have to quote it either way. Um, if it's it, The only thing that that could matter for is if you're trying to compare version strings and things. It, it can be different if you quote it versus don't quote it. Uh, just something to keep in mind later on in your Ansible journey. Solar checksum would be the uh, SHA 
what is it, SHA-512 is what solar stores here. If I go over here, the SHA-512. And that's going to let me um, make sure that the uh, when I download this file, I'm going to compare this uh, with what is downloaded to make sure that I'm actually downloading the right file. Uh, and that's to protect me. If, if one of these mirrors is compromised and somebody uploads a malicious tarball uh, and it, has, it doesn't match the checksum, then Ansible will fail if I, if I confirm that the checksum is correct. Uh, so that's the variables that I'm going to need for this playbook. Um, and I, have, I had the download link, which I just deleted. Uh, there it is. Uh, we'll need that in just a minute when we actually do the downloading with Drupal. Uh, so for the playbook, since this is an Ubuntu server, uh, anybody on Ubuntu knows that a lot of times, um, a lot of times, you try installing something and then it has an error message because the apt uh, caches are not up to date. Uh, so on a, every Ubuntu server I ever set up, I always add a pre-task um, that is update apt cache if needed. And to make this item potent, meaning it, I can run it once or a million times in a row and it doesn't make a change, I can add a, a cache valid time to this parameter. So I'm going to use the apt module and say update cache equals true, and then cache valid time equals 3600. And note again that this is, this is one style of writing ants. Well, this is like the shorthand style. You can also do this. Um, this is the structured style using YAML primitives. Uh, the, the only reason I do this sometimes in, in demonstrations is just to make sure that you can see everything. When I have five or six tasks, you can see it all in, in one screen instead of me having to scroll up and down a lot. Uh, so you, you might, uh, and I usually do this, you might want to use this style uh, when you're writing your own automation. You know, But for now, I'm just doing this. Uh, so don't complain about it too much in the comments. Um, Actually, I don't need another task there, and I need to fix this. Uh, so update cache, uh, that's the first thing that we'll do. Um, also, another thing that I typically do, if I'm going to install something that configures a service, uh, so for example, this is going to install a solar service, uh, the service might need to be restarted sometimes if I change a configuration value, or if later on when I'm building out this playbook, I want to be able to restart solar after something happens. So I usually add a handler for every service and you add those under the handler section of the playbook. And what this allows you to do, I'll show you in just a minute. First, I'm going to write the handler. Uh, so name, restart, solar. And uh, service, name equals solar, state equals restarted. And what this allows me to do is if I ever have a task in my tasks section, um, do, all right, let's see, change config, uh, command something to change config here. Uh, I can write notify restart solar. And what that does is after this task runs, it'll say trigger this handler when the when this play is over. And that lets that lets my uh, playbook be able to restart a service without me having to say change the config. And if the config is changed, then restart the service. It's just it saves you a lot of a lot of work because you can uh, notify these handlers from anywhere. And there's it's not just for services. You can use handlers for a lot of other things too. Uh, but it's typically something I do. I, I put in a handler for any service that I am installing. Uh, somebody oh somebody mentioned I don't have the dash dash dash. I better add that. There we go. And I'm gonna grab this URL out of here because it's not that's not valid YAML. Okay. So there now it's a pure YAML file because it has starts with the little dashes. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do for the installation is uh, Solar requires Java, and it can use Java 11, but we're this particular server is, I believe, running Ubuntu 16.04, and it's hard to get Java 11 on that uh, on that particular uh, OS without doing some some extra hoops and things and adding repositories. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is install Java. So I'm going to say name install Java. And luckily for me, uh, it's it's something that's in the distributions repository, so I don't have to do any extra setup here. I'm going to say apt name equals open JDK 8 JDK state is present. Uh, so that's going to install Java for me using the apt module. And I mentioned this earlier, you could use the package module too. And uh, for, for tasks that you want to make cross-platform, which we'll do in, in later playbooks, 
uh, you can use package to make it so that it would use apt or DNF or yum or pacman or whatever the package manager is on your platform. However, this particular package name wouldn't work correctly on CentOS, for example. So I'm, I'm just going to explicitly, explicitly use the apt module to make it clear this is intended for apt-based systems, Debian and Ubuntu and derivatives. Uh, the next step is I need to download uh, Solar. You technically could install Solar from the Ubuntu repositories, but the Ubuntu 16.04 uh, default repositories has a really old version of Solar. I think it might be like Solar 1.4 or Solar 3 point something. It's really old and unsupported. So we want to make sure that we have, um, we want to make sure that we have uh, Solar 8, and that's going to require us to do the installation uh, instructions that are in here, taking Solar to production. So the first thing I'm going to do is download Solar. Uh, download Solar. And I'm going to use Ansible's git URL module. And git URL has a lot of different options. Ansible git URL. And again, I could be looking this up with Ansible doc, doc git URL. That's funny. My, my brain just puts in a K on there for some reason, probably because I type in Docker a lot. Um, you can do it this way too, but I, I like the formatting on the, the uh, web for it. Uh, but I will open it here just so you can see what that looks like. Uh, and you can get, get through all the options and things in there. Um, but uh, on the web, it, it shows you all the different options that you can pass to it, including the checksum, which you can use to verify the downloaded file is correct. Um, and it has a lot of examples here. So we're going to uh, use a URL that we got from earlier, which is this one. Uh, that was the mirror that we copied off of, Ansel, or, uh, off of Solar's website. And uh, we want to replace the version here with the Solar version string that we, um, or the Solar version version number that we added in vars. So I'm going to take this variable name and I'm going to use Jinja to put that in line right here. Uh, when I use Jinja in line with any string in YAML, technically if it's not at the end or the beginning of the line, it would work fine. But if I were to do this like that and this whole thing were Jinja, you can see that the syntax highlighting goes a little berserk. Uh, so whenever I use Jinja in a string in any Ansible, uh, in, in any YAML, I always quote the entire string. So I add quotes around the whole thing. And that could be single or double quotes, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I always quote when I use Jinja in line. Uh, and this is the double, what is it, double handlebars or mustache or whatever, uh, is the way to indicate that you're using a variable. So I'm going to grab this variable and also use it here, because it needs to be there. Uh, so we're going to use that as the URL to get. Ansible is going to get that URL. Uh, and then I'm going to say the destination will be, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use quotes because I'm going to do another Jinja variable here. Uh, the destination will be the download dir, which is temp. That was defined in vars.yaml right here. Uh, we're going to download it to there, slash uh, solar dash solar version dot tgz. And the reason I'm specifying the full path to the file, including .tgz and everything here, is you can pass a destination of a directory, but if you don't pass the full file name that it's going to download, Ansible will report a change every time it runs this if that file doesn't already exist. Uh, so that's one way you can help with item potence when you're downloading files. And then I'm going to give a checksum for Ansible to check against, and that's going to be solar checksum which we defined already over in vars.yaml. And this is Ansible's shorthand uh, for checksums. You can put the type of checksum uh, before the actual checksum with a colon separating the two. And you can see that in the examples here. And it's documented up in here um, uh, under checksum right here. So uh, we have those things. And I believe that's it for the downloading. Um, I mentioned the directory. And I mentioned the checksum. It's important for security to make sure that you're downloading files that you believe to be legitimate. Um, and I'll take a look really quick on uh, some notes here. So uh, Wasm asks, uh, why, why did I do that update apt cache and pre tests and not tests? It's more my, my st style of playbook that I write. So I, I like to have pre tests as like setup stuff that doesn't really influence, like th this doesn't matter for solar. This is just something that has to happen on all Ubuntu servers and Debian servers. 
Uh, so I usually like to throw that into pre-tasks. And then post-tasks would be cleanup stuff that doesn't affect, like if it doesn't have to do with solar, like if I needed to notify somebody, I would do that in the post-task or something. Um, but you could put this into tasks if you wanted. It's, it's more a style thing. Um, my style is to have pre-tasks do things that, that need to be done before everything else. Um, and, and the order of this, uh, we can get into it in more in detail later, but basically Ansible will do pre-tasks and then uh, roles, which we haven't talked about yet, then tasks, then post-tasks when it's running through all of the things that it does. Um, so there was one good question. Uh, <laughs> Oliver Davies says he types Docker Composer a lot as a PHP developer. I, I often write uh, Composer instead of Compose, yeah. Um, and you're talking about uh, single and double quotes too. Um, it's funny, in, in YAML, it's not, there's no real preference. It, it doesn't really matter. And uh, YAML linters won't really complain if you do single or double quotes. In some other languages, it can actually make a difference. So some people prefer double quotes or single quotes for different things because of string interpolation. For Jinja and for YAML, it's, I haven't seen a performance difference. And I did some testing um, at one point because I'm like that. And I didn't see any significant percentage difference uh, when doing like millions of, of, of uh, instantations using the single or double quotes. So it's really up to your own style. I often use double quotes just because I, because that's what I do. But no linter that I've seen cares either way. Um, let's see. So I talked about the checksum. Um, I'm also uh, I'm also marking up my book here uh, with my notes uh, just to make sure I, I cover the important things. I might even, uh, maybe at the end of the series, I'll sign the book and give it away or find some way to, to do something fun. If you have any ideas on what I could do with this book afterwards, let me know. Um, let's see. You'd have to spray it down with some, some uh, uh, Lysol or something though, to make sure you're not getting coronavirus if I have it. Uh, let's see. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do, though, is uh, we downloaded the tarball. And the next thing we're going to do is use the unarchive module. So I'm going to say expand solar uh, and use unarchive, which is another uh, built-in module in Ansible that unarchives archives. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and I'm going to give it a source, which is uh, the same as this. This is the source of the unarchive will be the destination for the download. Uh, destination will be the download uh, and then remote source uh, is true. And this means that, uh, so I'll tell you what that means in just a second. It's hard to type and think at the same time uh, and creates. Um, I will talk, talk you about that as well. So for unarchive, uh, by default, what it will do is if you give it a source, it'll take a file on your local system or on your whatever host is running Ansible, and it will put it, it will copy it up to the server and then unarchive it on the server. Uh, if you have a file on the server already that you want to unarchive, you have to say remote source is true. That means it, do it all on the remote. It's not we're not copying an archive up and uh, expanding it. Also, I'm going to add the creates option here. Uh, some modules have creates as one of the parameters. You can pass straight to it. Uh, other modules like command and shell, you can actually add creates in part of the command or you can uh, pass it as an argument separately and, and uh, I'll show some of those options in the future as well. Uh, but creates is a way that you can control item potence because uh, the unarchive module might not know whether or not uh, an archive is expanded because it doesn't know what's inside the archive and it if it tried to track that, it, it wouldn't do that great. And it would have to store its state somewhere. Uh, so what we can say is, once it's expanded, we expect a certain file to exist. And if that file exists, it doesn't need to try doing this again. Uh, so what we're going to do for creates here is say, uh, download dir slash solar dash dash solar version uh, slash readme.txt. Because I know that the readme.txt file is going to be inside the expanded copy of Solar after it's unarchived. And how do I know that? Because I've done this before. Uh, but otherwise, you might do this in a test environment and see, or download the, the thing manually and see what's inside of it to grab a file that uh, is created. Uh, another, another quick note here is some people who use Ansible and are watching this might say, why did you use git URL and unarchive? Because um, unarchive can actually 
do both. You can actually unarchive a file directly from a download link. So I could put the source as a URL here. And the reason I do that is because Solar is a little unique. Again, I know this because I know it. It's not, uh, you wouldn't know this until after you tried installing and, and found issues. Uh, when you install Solar, the Solar installation script actually looks for the original, uh, un or the original tarball when it's doing the installation. And if it's not there, it will fail. Uh, so that's why I do this in two separate steps, because I need to preserve the uh, tarball and I need to have the downloaded directory expanded as well. Uh, but that is something to keep in mind is uh, when you're doing something like this, it's often easier just to use an archive and download a URL directly instead of downloading something, then expanding it. Um, just something to know. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, as mentioned in the solar installation instructions here, uh, there is an install solar service script, and we want to run that. And uh, just for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the script and look at all the options and things. I've already uh, found what the options are that I need to install solar correctly on the server. Uh, but I'm going to add a task to run that script. And in this case, since it's not like a standard type of installer that, that Ansible has a module for, I'm going to use the command module. And, in, and as I mentioned before, a lot of times it's easier to use Ansible if you can just pass commands and, and shell scripts and things into it that you already have or that are documented somewhere. And that's one reason I like Ansible a lot is because it, you can kind of have that hybrid where I have some of Ansible's modules, but I also can pass in a command, which I'm about to do. So I'm going to say run solar installation script uh, with command. And uh, there's a couple good questions I noticed in the chat that I'm going to get to in just a minute, uh, maybe while we're running this playbook. Download dir uh, slash solar solar version slash bin slash install solar. What is it called? Install solar service dot sh. Um, and uh, you notice that I added a, uh, what, a close bracket here. And this means that this is going to be a folded scalar, which means every line from here on down will be put together with one space between them. And it's just a way for making uh, commands be a little more legible and, and readable. Uh, let me make sure. It looks like my head is in the way of this. So let me make this a little higher. There you go. Uh, now you should be able to see it a little bit better. Uh, so the command is to run that script, and then I'm going to pass it. You have to pass it the path uh, to, I'm just going to copy this out. Um, pass it the path to the downloaded file, which is .tgz. Uh, that's the same as up here, uh, the source and the desktop there. Uh, so I have to pass it the path to the, the tarball, and then I say dash i opt, and that tells it uh, where it's going to install solar which earlier we said we're going to install it into the solar dir. Um, I could make this a variable too. And there's a lot of things I could make into variables in the script that uh, I, I may do it if I'm making this script a little bit more robust in the future or doing something like converting it to a role, which we'll do later. Um, I'm going to pass it uh, the data directory, which is var solar. And I'm going to pass it uh, the user that I want it to create, which is solar. And uh, the S is solar. I don't remember what S is for. Um, let's see what that is really quick. Dash S. Is that in here? Uh, it doesn't have... Oh, ser service name. So we want the service name to be solar. Uh, that can be customizable if you want to have maybe multiple versions of solar running at the same time, that kind of thing. Uh, dash P is the port that it's going to run on. 8983 is the standard. It's the default port, so I'll just stick with that. And then I'm going to add creates here. And like I mentioned up here, it creates as a way to ensure item potency. That way it won't run and rerun this command if it sees that solar is already installed. So when it installs solar, it's going to put it into solar dir uh, slash bin slash solar. And that won't exist until after the installation is over. Uh, so that's, that's the installation. And the installation script for this actually starts the service, but I also want to make sure that the service is started and enabled on boot up. So I'm going to add another explicit command here that says ensure solar is started and enabled at boot. Uh, service name is solar. State is started. Started, if I can spell. Enabled is yes. And again, 
uh, people might be cringing at seeing this this Ansible shorthand. Uh, you can always write it this way too, but again, I'm doing this for the, the purposes of easier, easier visibility of the entire script. Um, so uh, this is the playbook and you know going over the whole thing beforehand, it makes sure the apt cache is updated. I add a handler, which I'm not using in this particular playbook yet, but I probably would use it at some point if I do things like allow you to change configuration, like how much memory is available to the JVM uh, or the port that Solar's running on. Uh, then it's gonna install Java, which is a dependency of Solar, and then it downloads and expands the Solar archive and then it runs Solar's installation script, and then it makes sure it's running. So I believe that this playbook is all good. Um, one thing that you can always do to check if your playbook syntax is okay is say Ansible playbook uh, main.yaml, um, what is it, uh, syntax check. Uh, I often do that in CI and CD for, for a project just to make sure that, um, I'm going to pass the inventory too, uh, just to make sure that the syntax is always correct. Like if, if you add something wrong here, like test, uh, then I believe that this will fail uh, because that's not valid YAML. Uh, so it's a quick way to see, make sure that your YAML is at least valid. Uh, so I'm going to be able to run this playbook. I believe I, I already accepted the host key for this. If not, uh, remember earlier in the webcast, um, I mentioned that you can add the, the SSH options to accept the host key. Um, and I'm going to run this, and while it's running, I'll take a look at chat, and we'll see what's going on. So I'm going to say Ansible playbook main.yaml and let it run. And let's see if it can connect to the server. Someone earlier in chat mentioned, uh, why am I not using the Vagrant, uh, Vagrant VM locally for this? And I think someone already answered that person. Uh, the, problem, uh, the problem there is uh, my computer was absolutely dying last week. And, uh, and that was not even doing too much of, of uh, downloading and installing stuff. So I decided to do these examples for now on AWS VMs on EC2, where I might use something else in the future, we'll see. Um, just because it was a little easier on my laptop and it would make it not die all the time. The good news, as I mentioned earlier, I'm getting a new laptop, so we'll see if that helps uh, me be able to do this stuff without OBS crushing my computer. And I wanted to mention, some people have asked how I do these live streams and how I have it set up, my camera and the lighting and all that kind of stuff. I actually have a video earlier on my YouTube channel from last week or something like that about how I do live streams. So if you're interested in that, go take a look. Um, Let's see, there's a couple other questions that were going on here. Uh, someone said, yeah, that was the AWS thing. You can, yeah, it, I mean, the, the basic principle with, with where it's deployed to is you could do it locally in a VM. You could even do it in a Docker container locally. I do some testing that way. Uh, you can do it in AWS. You can do it on DigitalOcean or whatever. You just need a server running somewhere, basically, to do these things. Uh, someone mentioned Pac-Man reference for the win. Uh, someone should mention in chat, uh, I won't, I don't have anything besides respect to give you, but uh, what OS distro is Pac-Man used for? Um, uh, let's see, I answered that, Docker Composer instead of Compose. Uh, send the book to me, I'll take care of it. Well, I can't send it yet, we're still using it. Um, and someone mentioned, can you just use on archive? I went over that, yeah. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I, I usually like the multi-line syntax, the, the more structured YAML for these things. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's easier for you to see everything that's going on when, it, when it's a little more compact for these simpler tasks. Um, doo -doo -doo, why not VS Code? <laughs> Sublime is l lacking. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm using a Mac too, so some people hold that against me. Uh, do I need to unindent line 42? No, so um, if I just did this, uh, like I said, different modules use different options for it. Uh, this would not uh, work because the command, well, first of all, creates is not a top level option. And uh, what you can do, I forget what it is, like args or something like that. Uh, I forget what the exact syntax is. I always have to look it up because I forget. Uh, but there's an option that you can do that will pass extra arguments to the command module. Uh, but I, I often do it in line like this if I'm just writing a long command anyway. Either way's but either way's fine, um, but it's probably even better to do it the other way to pass the option in a structured way. Uh, someone said thanks for the video series. You're very welcome, Dave. 
Um, I hope it helps. Uh, are you able to make auto indentation for work? Sometimes, uh, so it, that's something I actually haven't uh, set up too well. So it, Sublime, it, it does work because technically if I'm on this line and I want to make a new line, this is a new key value pair here. Uh, but it, it would be nice to say like if I, um, if I want to go down one space, I don't want this extra space in here. That's something that you'd have to figure out in your own code editor. I've never spent the time to make Sublime work exactly how I want. Uh, but this playbook is done, and now uh, to prove the item potency, I'm just going to run it all again. And every task should just report OK, 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 if I did it right over here at least. Uh, and we'll see if that's the case. Um, so, so far so good. And expand solar is going to be skipped because I used the creates option on it. Uh, and run solar, uh, it's funny, it, I, I I thought that would report skipped since it sees that solar's there, but it just reports OK. I guess that's how command works uh, when it sees the file is already, already created. Uh, so now the cool thing is I can go to the server. And you might be thinking maybe you could too since it's a public IP, but if you try it, you'll fail. Uh, but I'm going to go to the server 8983, and I should be able to get uh, solar here. And here it is. It started three minutes ago when we ran the playbook. It's running solar 8.5. You can see how much memory is available to it by default. And here's all the options that Solar is using on its boot. Uh, so um, this, this example is a little bit simple. Uh, in the real world, I would also have a couple tasks to create a Solar core. Um, and it would do that automatically instead of making go into the admin and do it here and create a folder on the server. Uh, but, but this is now a completely functional Solar server that you could start integrating with Drupal or WordPress or experience manager, whatever system that you're using that uses uh, Apache Solar. And uh, really from here, that most of the things that you would do this playbook are maybe make some of these things more parameters in case you're running different servers on different ports, that kind of thing. Um, and you might also add some more solar configuration, like being able to uh, change the port, being able to change how much memory the JVM uses. By default, it's 512 megs is the XMX max or whatever it is. Um, but you could increase that or decrease that as needed. Um, but this is this is how I started. Uh, it's funny. I, I run a service called Hosted Apache Solar. And in the first couple of years, I had maybe uh, five or ten clients, and I had one server. And it was easy to configure everything, and I just did it all by hand. But as time went on, and I got uh, uh, hundreds of clients on, I think I'm up to 80 or 90 servers now, it was much harder to manage all of that with shell scripts, so that, that was the first thing that I started using Ansible on. And I still use uh, playbooks very similar to this, and um, I have a role called gearlingguy.solar that does a lot of this stuff, but a little bit more configurable, uh, that basically runs the service. Uh, so this is not far from what is done to actually build production infrastructure, and you could, you could even use this playbook that's from the book uh, for very simple use cases. Uh, because, you know, if you have a, a site that only has a few hundred or a few thousand uh, pieces of content on it, it could all be indexed in under 512 megs of RAM. Uh, but that is the example for today. Uh, is there anything else that I wanted to talk about? Uh, let's see, um, hosted solar and, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I have a uh, quote to live by. I forgot to do this for the first couple of chapters, but in the book, uh, you'll notice at the bottom of certain pages. So this is uh, chapter four's quote. I always have the cow say, the little cow icon uh, with a special quote. And in Ansible for Kubernetes, I use Star Trek quotes because Kubernetes has a heritage of uh, Star Trek lore and, and folkdom, folklore and whatever it is. Uh, but today's quote is, Ever if everything is under control, you're going too slow. And that sometimes is uh, a little too, too true. Um, other times it feels like things are just going crazy for no reason at all. Uh, but I hope you liked today's episode. And again, um, if you did like it, who I even made for this week, I'm starting to figure out how OBS works. So I made these little social links below me. Um, if you liked today's episode, please go ahead and click the like button below here uh, and subscribe to the channel. I have a lot more good content coming. Uh, future episodes, we're going to talk about testing playbooks, uh, both simple tests and also with, uh, with Molecule. We're going to go into a little more deep dive of different advanced things that you can do with playbooks. We're going to talk about roles. 
Uh, and eventually we're going to start talking about some of the other more advanced use cases in the later chapters. I probably, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, and I would love to hear your comments. Uh, you can leave a comment on here uh, or ping me on Twitter or something. Uh, I'm not going to do every single example in the book because that might take years for us to do. Uh, but I would like to pick a couple of the best examples maybe from each chapter and go through them. Uh, the ones that highlight most of Ansible stuff. But if you want to uh, mention which things you're most interested in, that's really helpful for me. I know every single person almost has asked for molecule testing. Uh, so I'm definitely getting to that very soon. Don't worry. Um, uh, but again, uh, if you like this stuff, uh, like and subscribe and all that stuff. And uh, if you are able to, uh, in addition to trying to support your local food pantries and, and people who are having trouble right now with jobs and things, uh, if you like this stuff and you want to see more of it, please consider supporting me on GitHub, GitHub Sponsors, which is right here, uh, Patreon, which is right here. Uh, you can't really support me on Twitter, but there that is over there, I guess. Uh, but thank you for watching the stream today. I hope to see you next week. It'll be same time, same place, 10 a.m. Uh, U.S. Central or 3 p.m. UTC, uh, and hopefully... Hopefully at some point we can start uh, seeing each other in person again. Uh, there were a lot of different events this year that I've already missed out on, on networking opportunities, but I feel somewhat connected being able to do these streams. So hopefully you're getting some, uh, something out of them, and I will uh, talk to you next week. And we'll see if the stream actually ends on time. Judging by the way it started, it could be 10 or 15 minutes of me standing here staring at the camera.